Hello and welcome everybody to the Be The Bombs podcast. Adam and Vanessa Lambert do, doing the, what do I always say? Doing, doing the, the podcasting. Podcast. <laughs> yeah. I got to come up with something new. Like, what would doing be, what the, else? Uh, would uh, pigeon? Do the, <laughs> <laughs> I don't yes. know if you guys know the uh, uh, pigeon, but when I was a kid, there was a Bert, no. Yeah, it was a Bert and Ernie, I think. Anyway, it was a video that we watched with my little cousin. So whenever we babysat her, there was this little sing-along video, and it was doing the uh, uh, pigeon, and it was this little dance. Yeah, so. well, we could, I mean, we can bring that back. <laughs> so Adam and Vanessa doing the uh, 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 pigeon. pigeon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, it makes sense. That didn't take long to get off track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's okay, because yeah. we've got a whole bunch of time to get on track yes and then also just out into the weeds in this podcast <laughs> definitely so this is really cool because we actually recorded this podcast many many months ago when we were at paleo fx with the awesome dennis mckenna mm-hmm. and um if you're not familiar with dennis mckenna's work you should probably google him and his brother terrence who is sadly no longer with us but um these guys did some some serious pioneering in their day yes. Yes, yeah. and uh, you may hear the word or the term psychonaut mm-hmm. tossed around, and those are kind of uh, psychedelic explorers or, or uh, yeah, sort of, you know. Yeah, well, it's people who are exploring the outer reaches of their consciousness. Yes, so, exactly. Which can be done in any number of ways, right? Yes. So, yeah, well, breath work, deprivation tanks, psychedelics, combinations of all those things, you know, uh, near-death experiences, right? So there's all these things that kind of push you out into that the outer boundaries, so to speak, of, uh, of the consciousness. And, and uh, the brothers McKenna were ethnobotanists yes. who... In ethnopharmacologists, the, yeah. Yeah, ethnopharmacologists, mm-hmm. yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, at the end of the day, in the early, mid to early 70s, were doing the damn thing, you yes. know? And, and uh, we'll, well, we'll, let, uh, we'll let Dennis tell the story because it's, it's pretty great to hear from his mouth, but... Uh, yeah, those guys have been in it for a while. They have. They certainly have. And, you know, I think it's interesting in terms of a lot of these folks that you hear, especially um, the folks that are still around doing this work in psychedelics and kind of uh, being proponents for their the medical uh, efficacy of these certain plant medicines or even just the spiritual and psychotherapy uh, benefit mm-hmm. of these plant medicines. A lot of them, you know, they initially started as just explorers of their own consciousness, but then ended up realizing in order to legitimize these practices, in order to kind of put these on the map as actual modalities, that, you know, it was important to kind of go into academia and and to Mm -hmm. become these, you know, actual researchers in the field of, you know, ethnopharmacology or what have you. And you can see that with um, the MAPS folks that are Mm -hmm. really trying to legitimize these, these plants for their therapeutic benefit. And it's pretty... It's cool to see, you know, um, in his lifetime, I'm sure, to see it go from sort of this fringe, you know, experimental societal thing to becoming now, at least in a mainstream conversation, Mm -hmm. I can only imagine that there's um, so much pride in the process of being part of that. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. And we, you know, we were at Paleo FX and basically I made a beeline for Dennis and was like, I'm super excited to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? He's like, I'm not sure why, but, you know. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> uh, I was like, out of everybody here, I'm so excited. And he was really sweet to us. And honestly, yeah. we um, we really hit it off with him and we were really felt privileged that he took the time for us to sit down after paleo fx was over and just talk about his experience and talk about his contribution and sort of what you know what he stands for in terms of this movement and it was pretty cool yeah it was super awesome and so you can check out more of what he's got going on with the hefter institute h-e-f-t-e-r institute and they're doing a bunch of research specific to psilocybin so magic mushrooms and what goes on with with um psilocybin and treatment re- resistant PTSD and depression and all of this stuff. And yeah, so Hefter, Hefter Institute is a place to go to check that out, stuff out. And yeah, you can just Google McKenna yes. and you'll get one of the two of them. And their books are fantastically interesting to read. And um, yeah, without further ado, here's Dennis. Welcome to the podcast, Dennis. Thank you. This is really exciting. And we kind of, well, actually, I made a beeline for you immediately when I saw you at the speaker's dinner, and I was so excited, and you immediately asked me, why are you so excited to see me? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and it turns out you want to do a podcast. So yeah. I'm just, you know, so you were, you were, you were a predator. Essentially. I was essentially <laughs> a predator. You identified me as a, here's, here's a guy who never says no to anybody. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, actually... it's, it's pretty incredible that you're, that you're taking the time for us because you've been on quite the bender here. Like we're, you know, coming to you from paleo effects where obviously you've been speaking and, and speaking and speaking. Yes. So we're, we're super appreciative of your time. Well, thank you, thank you. It, 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 you know, I sometimes tell people, I mean, I don't necessarily choose this, but I tell people I work for the plants. Mm -hmm. You know, I really have this feeling that I'm a spokesman for the plants. Yeah. I just didn't know the plants were gonna work me so damn hard. <laughs> <laughs> but they do, so, okay. Slave drivers, it's, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, they're slave drivers, they are slave yeah. drivers, but uh, that's all right. It's good work, it's an important message, so. Absolutely. Thank yes. you and other people like you for giving me a forum to talk about what I'm passionate about, what I think is really important. We yeah. covered a little of it today, but uh, you know, yeah. So again, uh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, 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 of course. So, you know, one of the things that's really important to us in our podcast is helping people to discover when they come up against something, whether that's a barrier in their mindset or in their physical ability or in the way that they're living life and how they, what tools they use to sort of progress or expand past that, that point where they currently find themselves. And so I got to thinking about interviewing you and thinking about the time that you probably spent discovering psychedelics, psych ayahuasca, mushrooms, I'm thinking about the time frame that you were in and how that must have been for you to navigate the waters of sort of moving into this this world this paradigm of discovery through psychedelics and how how you found yourself buffering the societal norms that you were in to sort of discover what was possible through these plant medicines so i i would love to start this out by talking about that time where you discovered psychedelics and you, I'm assuming, found yourself at a crossroads saying, I really see some benefit and some potential in these plants, but how do I actually integrate this into the world that I'm living in right now? Right, right. Well, um, yeah, I have, to, uh, I have to correct a few misconceptions, you know. <laughs> One is the, the misconception that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I, you know, I did not know what I was doing in some ways. I mean, it's not like I went into this with full clarity and understanding of where mm -hmm. I was going. It's been a process of discovery, mm -hmm. really. And I, and I think like everyone of my generation, which is much, much older than your generation, you know, <laughs> we were children of the 60s and we were involved in what was going on in the 60s, all the political and social ferment of which uh, psychedelics were a huge part. You know, LSD was in the society, but people didn't really know what to make of it, what to do with it, other than a sort of perception that this was part of the change that we were undergoing. But we had no cultural context for for LSD and any of the other psychedelics. You know, we were rediscovering them. We didn't know about the, the uh, you know, long traditions of the use of these things and all that. So LSD kind of was a true disruptor in society. It was like dropping a bomb into the social and cultural ferment. And it affected and changed a lot of people's thinking. For me personally, and for my brother, and of course he can't be excluded from this because he was a big influence on me. He was four years older than me. Mm -hmm. Just at that age, and I was the little brother, and obviously mm -hmm. Terence was brilliant and he was into all sorts of cool stuff. And I just wanted to be the little brother and tag along and be in his, his parade, you know? And, 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 you know, by the time we reached the age earlier, he wasn't so happy about that. But by the time we reached the age that, you know, we were young adults, uh, he and I became colleagues more than, more than uh, you know, we got past those sibling rivalries that everybody had. And Terrence was in Berkeley at the time, a, a student at the University of California, and this was like 
the late 60s, you know, and I was still stuck in back in my podunk Colorado town, <laughs> wanting to be almost anywhere else, but especially wanting to be in the Bear Area where the action was. And uh, I, so I was as caught up in the social ferment counterculture movement as anyone else. For some reason or another, and I'll never understand why, my father let me go to California in 67 <laughs> for the summer of love in 1967. Wow. Even though it represented apparently everything he was against. Mm -hmm. But he let me go anyway. So I showed up. I went out to Berkeley that summer with a good friend of mine and had that was my really my introduction. I, I took LSD for the first time that summer. Mm -hmm. And then my brother had already discovered DMT mm -hmm. at the time. And DMT was very rare. There wasn't much of it around. People didn't really know, you know, it wasn't what everybody was talking about. But uh, it was, but he was able to work the matrix and find DMT, mm -hmm. you know, and DMT seemed to both of us to be something um, quite different than other psychedelics. I mean, an order of magnitude, more impactful, stranger, even to the extent that, you know, we thought that it was a portal to another dimension, I'll mm -hmm. tell you that right out. And of right. course, it didn't hurt that we were immersed in science fiction and all of those concepts, mm -hmm. you know. So it didn't seem so strange within our reference frame, but we'd always been wondering, is it possible to, you know, penetrate to other dimensions? And then, and then along comes this compound, and I was like, yep. It appears that we can. <laughs> so, so, so DMT was not simply the most interesting drug that came onto our radar. It was the most interesting thing that came onto our radar and ever had been that we'd ever encountered. And we thought, this has got to be important, mm -hmm. you know. And we, but one of the things about DMT, if you know anything about its action, it's very, very short. It right. only lasts about. 10 or 15 minutes right. and you come back from that with little more than a sense of astonishment it's like OMG what was that <laughs> you know but you yes. don't come back with a lot of noetic content other than that this general perception that it's really amazing and it's almost incomprehensible and it's like you know you can hardly get your head around it right, you, know, right. you can't get your head around it so we were we were interested in finding a, a more prolonged form of DMT, if you will. We wanted we figured if we could spend more time in that place, we could mm -hmm. understand it better. You know, right. I mean, that's like being on a ship. You have to be there long enough to get your sea legs so you can wander around and yeah. see and see what's out there in that's this great way to put it. undiscovered continent. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and so. At the time, late 60s, 68, 69. Ayahuasca was not even understood to be an orally potentiated form of DMT. That mm. work all came later, you know, and the importance of the admixtures and the fact that the admixtures were, uh, you know, what gave uh, ayahuasca psychedelic properties. This wasn't even understood mm -hmm. at that time, mm. and, you know, that it, they contained DMT and so on. Um, so we actually found a uh, we stumbled on an article published by Richard Schultes, the famous Harvard ethnobotanist, which was the title of it was called Varola as an Orally Active Hallucinogen. Mm -hmm. Varola is the genus of trees mm -hmm. in, the, in the nutmeg family that is, that is used as snuffs in different parts uh -huh. of the Amazon. So it contains DMT, 5-methoxy DMT, a bunch of tryptamines and they make the snuff into a, the, the sap into mm -hmm. a powder and they use that as a snuff. Mm -hmm. But this article was about the Witoto uh, tribe and they used it as an orally active preparation and we thought, aha, this is what we're looking for. This has got to be the secret. Mm -hmm. You know, when we even called it the secret, <laughs> and <laughs> before the, and before this, the, yeah, the other yeah. secret, and, yeah. and at that time, I mean, we really uh, had this sort of mythic perspective. What we said, we gotta go get this thing wow. because this is the secret. So we quit school, we quit, gave up our jobs. What you know, which 
wasn't really such a sacrifice because we didn't have that much going anyway. But, <laughs> you know, we, I mean, I was a student. I was an undergraduate. My brother was not even in school at that time. So, uh -huh. so we and some people, you know, just to said, well, we got to go to La Chirera and find this, this drug, which was called Ukuhe. Mm -hmm. Ukuhe in the Watoto language. We thought, this is the secret. This is the Holy Grail. And, uh, you know, and we had this sort of mythic perspective on ourselves and this quest that was kind of tongue in cheek mm -hmm. in a certain way. Being Irish, you know, <laughs> we don't take anything too seriously. Uh -huh. and, you know, so we came up, you know, we called ourselves the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Right? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Which is where the title of my book comes from. Yeah. Please buy it. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's, good, that's good my plug. Good job, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great song. <laughs> most, most people think it's great, and it, it's the full story. But anyway, so we went, we, this was 1971. Our mother had just died like three months previously of cancer. Mm. And so we were both spiritually wounded, mm -hmm. maybe more than we even realized, of you course. know. Um, but we said, we have to go on this quest to find this, this, amazing, this amazing medicine, which mm -hmm. we thought of as the Philosopher's Stone. You know, and, and we were very much steeped in alchemy and shamanism and, and that sort of perspective at that time. So we, just, we and, and three of our, of Terence's friend, who were just as crazy as he was, <laughs> you know, and I decided to go to La Chirera and we went there in search of this thing. What we found when we got there Eventually, we did find a kuhe, mm -hmm. but it took much longer than we thought. And, and eventually, and, and when we finally got it, it was not as impressive as we thought. Mm -hmm. But what we did find when we got to La Chirera was psilocybin mushrooms in abundance because the pasture around the mission village, it was a little capuchin mission, had been cleared, had, the forest had been cleared. They would brought cattle in there it happened to be the height of the rainy season. Mm. So there were big, beautiful clusters of Psilocybe cubensis growing out of every cow pie. <laughs> you literally could not walk through the pasture without kicking these things over practically. I wow. mean, they were abundant. Wow. And we knew what they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, from an academic point of view, we'd mm -hmm. done our home. We knew they were psilocybin mushrooms. We had no experience with psilocybin mushrooms, except we you know, we knew what the, theoretically, what it was like. Mm -hmm. We knew it was similar to LSD and so on. And our attitude, we were very cavalier about it. We, we said, well, you know, it's gonna take a while to find Ukuhe. We had been warned by an anthropologist that we'd encountered on the way in, that you can't just march into this village and start talking about this. Mm. You know, this is a big secret. If you do, they'll probably kill you. You know, well, that was a little exaggerated. But <laughs> we understood the reason, you know, the need for some cultural sensitivity and you right. couldn't just wander into this village and say, hey, where's the Okuhe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, yeah. Hey, a little bit. And so these mushrooms were there and we thought, well, th this will be, we can, this will be this fun will while we're waiting for the real secret to come up. Right. You know, we can have fun with these. Fun with fungi, right? right? <laughs> um, and so we started eating them and we started eating them quite on a quite regular basis because there wasn't, I mean, we would incorporate them into our meals because there wasn't a whole lot else to eat. Uh -huh. You know, we had rice, we had beans, we had eggs, and mushrooms <laughs> go well with all of those things. Right. Yeah. So we were, we were, uh, you know, we were just eating them in a very sort of casual way and I'm not, mm -hmm. not recreational and not really thoughtful. Uh, and the mushrooms had their own agenda in a mm -hmm. certain sense, and they quickly made it clear that they were the real secret. Mm. You know, they were the real secret, and they were, in fact, the per perfect orally active form of DMT that we had been seeking. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about the chemistry of psilocybin and mm -hmm. psilocin, psilocybin is four phosphoryl dimethyltryptamine, and when you take it, that phosphoryl group is cleaved off and you have 4-hydroxy-dimethyltryptamine, 4-HO-DMT. Mm. That's simple, very, so it's very, very similar to DMT. It differs only by one atom, that additional oxygen on the ring. 
that's enough of a difference to make it orally active. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, protect, it is protected from degradation by monoamine oxidase, which is what makes DMT inactive orally. So it's orally active and requires no processing, no mixing, no nothing. And, uh, and it produces a profound uh, psychedelic experience that is clearly of the DMT dimension. You know, I think of these, there are various tryptamines, many types of tryptamines and found in all of these, sac many of these sacred medicines. I mean, if you look at the, the, the sacred medicines that are used in South America, uh, they all come down to tryptamine active ingredients of some kind or another, DMT or 5-methoxy DMT or propylene or whatever. So, so psilocybin was the plant teacher and as we started uh, ingesting it on a pretty regular like daily basis, um, it stimulates thinking. Yes. <laughs> it stimulates conversation. It stimulates. It stimulates speculation. Mm -hmm. You know, as well as all the visual effects and so on. It really opens you up right. to a realm of possibilities that you're normally not aware of. And you're also in a place where you have the space to go there. We right? are. We were in a place where we had the space. Mm -hmm. Where yeah, there was right. nobody going to show up and and cart us off to the mental institution. Right. Right. Some of our colleagues thought that was exactly what needed to happen. But, you know, they, they couldn't do that because, you know, you can't just call in a, an ambulance and say, get right. these people into the clinic before they, you know, before they completely go off tracks. And that's very, that was very good because mm -hmm. it gave us the, the chance to live out this, this drama, this process that was going on in our dialogue with the mushrooms mm -hmm. and, and the mushrooms at first it was quite recreational if you've taken mushrooms you know they can be really pleasurable really yeah. you know kind of giggly and not and threatening you know mm -hmm. at all but it, it quickly got more serious because it was almost as though we felt in the in the presence of an intelligent being mm -hmm. you know there is this tendency to form a i i thou dialogue Understand that's probably a projection. That's probably a part of me that's coming out and presenting as not me. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes you would swear that it's it's <laughs> it's really there is an intelligence out there that you're in discussions with, so to speak. But I think I mean, I feel like it's it's um, it's well understood though that obviously plants do have feelings, so to speak, and so if we can accept that they have feelings why wouldn't we accept that they have an intelligence, right? We, 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 <laughs> why wouldn't they? Why, well, right. many do, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's the West. It's the, our Western consciousness that, that thinks of nature as dead in a way and without mm -hmm. intelligence or not dead exactly, Separate. but with, without mm -hmm. a real mind or consciousness. And actually that paradigm is changing. You know, it used right. to be yes. 10 years ago, if you talked about plant consciousness or plant intelligence, <laughs> people would say, you know, you're in the wrong place. You belong <laughs> over there with the, with the nuts and the screwballs. Right. Not so anymore. Mm -hmm. Actually, plant intelligence, plant intelligence is a serious, uh, you know, topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. I want to mention there's a wonderful uh, essay uh, that Michael Pollan wrote. Mm -hmm. You might know who yes. Michael Pollan mm -hmm. is in the New Yorker called The Intelligent Plant. Yes. And I think it's a great essay. You can just Google it and mm -hmm. read it. And yeah. it talks Familiar about some of the it, yeah. emerging work on plant, plant intelligence. And it depends on how you want to define intelligence, but plants right. have a behavior. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned in my talk, they, they work mostly through chemistry. Chemistry is their language, but they get a lot done through, through chemistry, Absolutely. through these signal transduction processes. And if intelligence is the uh, ability to op adapt to your environment and optimize it and make it good for your, you know, fullest flourishing, then plants are very intelligent, mm -hmm. you know, and more intelligent than we because we, we haven't achieved that yet. I mean, there are many yeah. things about our environment that are certainly not optimal. Right, right. 
but anyway, in this context of La Chirera, it was like it was almost like having the guest that came to dinner, you know, uh, and the and the dinner was mushroom, and the and the evening's entertainment was built into the meal, you know. <laughs> and then, I love it. And it started suggesting all sorts of really bizarre ideas to mm -hmm. us about what we might do with our own physiology and our own voices uh, because one of the things that had uh, you know become kind of interesting in our experiences with DMT was the sound effects sometimes uh, I mean DMT often comes with a lot of sound effects in internal sound buzzing mm -hmm. screaming you know high frequency I don't know what that is, you mm -hmm. know, but it's very common. And on mushrooms, this happens as well. Sometimes at high doses, you can hear a sound. Right. And, uh, and not only can you hear it, but if you listen carefully, you can actually imitate that sound. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to imitate, but you can sing it, you know. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if you keep trying, it will, you'll reach a place where you can just lock on to it. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to pour out of you in a way that you almost cannot control, mm -hmm. and is is really kind of frightening, you know, because it's like it's just it's just coming out of you. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, what is that, and why does this happen, and what's the significance of it? And uh, and the mushroom was there with an answer, you know. This is the uh, what you're hearing is the electron spin resonance of your this process of the psilocybin metabolizing through your brain wow. Wow. and uh, if you <laughs> imitate this sound you can actually do a kind of psychic surgery on yourself wow. i mean th this is crazy stuff no, it was this like is, this is awesome though because if we actually hear about musical therapies like at actual you know people tuning to certain frequencies to help healing essentially in, in well, folks yeah now it doesn't sound so crazy mm -hmm. because of what we're learning about the power of sound mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm really coming to think that without that 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 is the the optimal uh, context in which to use psychedelics when you mm -hmm. have these overtonal harmonics to yeah. kind of guide and shape the experience I mean it has so much to do with uh, you know the way our systems are, are organized right. and mm -hmm. you've probably heard of what is the term chymatics mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah you know where you put a powder on a plate and and make a certain sound and it will form a Makes pattern a yeah mm -hmm. it does the same thing in our brains it does the same thing on a, on a bodily level when you're exposed right. to these it's very organized or organizing mm -hmm. um, so it's not so crazy but yeah. at the time and without really having any kind of theoretical framework we we were told that if we did this we could uh, actually uh, you know, if we were to make this sound and direct it toward a mushroom, that we could set up a standing waveform resonance in the mushroom that could combine with the standing waveform resonance in our own DNA yeah. and form the transcendental object at the end of time to <laughs> actually <laughs> manifest, manifest a physical object that was both mind and matter at the same time. You would both be able to see it and be it at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. And it would be everything that mystics and the philosophers and the sort of uh, technicians of the sacred have always thought about. Mm -hmm. It would be the UFO, the philosopher's stone, the resurrection body. All of, mm -hmm. you know, history anticipates the creation of something that is an object it, but it's also biological and it's also made up of of mind and we were trying to create that object it was like it was downloading blueprints to us from some superior source mm -hmm. which we imagined yeah. to be either the mushrooms or the mushrooms were a con conduit for an extraterrestrial so, uh, and I'm, so we performed that experiment, and it had spectacular <laughs> results, but not what we expected. <laughs> I, I, how I'll, could it? Yeah, how could, how it, could yeah. it? And yeah, how well, could you have that, an expectation? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Isn't that like one of the, it's, it's like a saying in, in, for scientists, right? Like, where they're true, everybody thinks Eureka, I found it, but really it's like, huh. 
I wasn't expecting that, you know, like whatever that outcome is. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. where you find the, the true discoveries. Now, having narrated this in part, I want to say, I don't necessarily stand by any of this. Right. I mean, right. It was, you it's know. It's just how it happened. I mean, yeah. this, what happened was uh, a real case study in some kind of pathology. But, you know, uh, and you can read about the experiment at La Chirera, and you know, in my book, Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, or Terry Terence's book, True Hallucinations. Mm -hmm. We go into it in depth, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. actually, it was a pivotal event in our lives, and then the the rest of our lives, which has been most of our lives, has really been lived in the shadow of of this thing and trying to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened and did it mean anything? Right. I recently gave a talk at Breaking Convention last summer in the UK, and I talked about, the title of the talk was The Experiment at La Chirera, Psychotic Break, Shamanic Initiation, or Alien Encounter. <laughs> <laughs> what about all, all of, of the me, above, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I was pushing for Alien Encounter in yeah. the talk, that yeah. in some ways, what happened to us, uh, you know, fits all of those models that you could say, well, they, they just went to the Amazon, they took too many drugs, they got very deluded and right. came up with this crazy idea. Well, I don't like that model, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's pretty, uh, you know, unflattering. Yeah. For a long time, and I think there's some truth to the idea that it was a shamanic initiation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it certainly was an initiation of some kind mm -hmm. and a lot of the mythical themes of shamanic initiation were were in there. Now, I'm not a shaman. I don't consider myself a shaman, but right. I understood that, that that. But then it also fits a lot of the paradigms of alien encounters. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is what I was thinking, mm -hmm. you know, at the time when I presented that. Um, you know, there were just certain alien, alien encounters, whether or not an actual UFO is the siren song, you know, there is the call of the secret. Well, we're in the grip. We were convinced we were after a major secret, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that is what led us. And then there was contact with this intelligence, which apparently was not human and had a whole lot to tell us, mm -hmm. you know, and wanted, it was like, pay attention, this is important. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so information was exchanged and secrets were given, you know, and, and there were gifts given. In the case of, uh, of our experience, we took away two things of importance, I think. One was Terence's ideas about the time wave. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really, that grew out of the experience at La Chirera, that two weeks when we were, you know, kind of in hyperspace, if you right. will, both <laughs> different parts of hyperspace, mm -hmm. that idea. Also an important thing that came out of it was uh, nothing supernatural or anything but the spores of the mushroom, right. which we brought back with us. Mm -hmm. And then we learned how to grow them. And over the next couple of years, we learned how to grow them. And uh, we, were, we were interested in this because partly mercenary motives, but mostly because we wanted to let other people grow them and, and then have the experience so they confirm, could confirm or not, mm -hmm. that what we had been undergoing was, you know, part of the territory, uh -huh. part of the phenomenology of psilocybin, or just part of our own psychopathology. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and not all at yeah. all what people experience. Well, of course, over the years, so we developed this very simple technology to grow mushrooms. Any, any, you know, fairly nerdy tenth grader could figure this out. <laughs> right. It was not a, it was you know like a home science fair project right, or right. something. And so the mushrooms came to the world that way, and uh, and uh, lo and behold, people did grow them, and they did have these experiences. And I really think. Even though this happened in in the mid '70s and through the deepest, darkest '80s, you know, when nobody talked about psychedelics, it was a taboo subject. Except right. there were a small group of people who kind of kept the faith, mm -hmm. and people that were serious about psychedelics could 
make their own. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't have to rely on, on drug cartels or anything like that. You could right. go to the grocery store, buy the ingredients, have a closet full of mushrooms yeah. before you knew it. Right, you know? right. <laughs> so I'm curious because you're you're in search of this secret. And how long did it take for you to just really, or, or maybe I'll, I'll let you put this in your own words, but did you immediately realize that it was the mushrooms all along calling to you? Um, I don't know if we thought of it in that way, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think, I mean, when we went to La Chirera, you know, our goal was to find this exotic drug called ukuhe, but it was still basically an ethnobotanical mm -hmm. expedition. We right. were looking for an exotic plant preparation. Uh -huh. And as weird as that was, it was simply, you know, a botanical expedition. Well, when we got there, it very quickly shifted into, you know, a hyperinflation of you know, enormous proportions, and that the idea that we were we were trying to uncover, uh, not only uncover but implement a secret that was going to do no less than end history, mm. right. and you know, <laughs> yeah. create this 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 impossible object. That's why it couldn't succeed because this thing, you know, couldn't possibly exist I mean, without violating every law of physics so far <laughs> known, you know, and laws of physics tend to be fairly rigid, you know, mm -hmm. and that yeah. didn't bother us. We were, right. that was the whole agenda, you mm -hmm. know, we're going to yeah. completely uh, overturn the paradigm. Um, so, yeah, when we got there, it became clear that this is what we'd come for. Right. And it was like the mushroom calls, yes. you know, yeah, and absolutely. people say that. And, yeah, absolutely. And the we plant were called, call, right? And, yeah. yeah. But then, you know, you have to, so we, we, we came to this place. We spent weeks, actually, in, in this place that geographically was very remote, and it was like being in a parallel dimension almost, you know, we were, and then it was a parallel dimension <laughs> yeah. in terms of our state of consciousness. But right. in other words, we had to go to this place where literally, you know, they, you couldn't call the ambulance, mm -hmm. you couldn't, and right. you know, so we were, uh, we were in an optimal situation where it could play out, mm -hmm. right. and I was very grateful for that, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I was the one that got the biggest hit, as it were. I was the one that was getting the download from the mushroom about, here's how you transform your body and mind into a UFO. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's super useful information. That <laughs> right, <is. Yeah. laughs> right. And we, we did it, we did the experiment, but it, it could not succeed. Uh, in the way we thought it would, because it was just impossible. But the the result was that instead of violating the laws of physics, something had to give mm -hmm. in, a, in a way. We were convinced that the information we was getting was leakage from the future. Uh. That was uh, that that proved that a few hours up ahead, we had, if you think of time that way, and we did. Right few hours up ahead, we'd done the experiment and it had succeeded. And that's why things were so apparently very strange, even in, not in, just in our heads, but in the real world, mm -hmm. you know? And so when we performed the experiment and it didn't have the predicted results, something had to give. And what, ha what gave is that we both had this prolonged altered state we were no longer eating mushrooms. We were way beyond that. We created some kind of state that just sustained itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And during that period, only my brother and I could really understand each other. We knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. right. We could understand each other because we were involved in the paradigm. Our colleagues who had not participated were utterly appalled, <laughs> right? You know, they thought you'd, they'd lost not you. <laughs> so much. They thought we'd lost mm -hmm, it, right? Mm -hmm. right? And really pushed an agenda that we have to bring this to an end, get these people airlifted somewhere. Well, it wasn't possible, right? right. And that's good because we could, we, you know, we could play out, right? And eventually, we did reintegrate into reality, but in some ways, uh, it's it's never left. Yeah, you yeah, know, not, yeah. There's no going back from. Yeah, you always think of that as a 
pivotal point in your life. Uh -huh. right. And most of the ideas, or theories, or whatever that came out of that, I don't necessarily believe today. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also say, I mean, I don't regret it for a minute. Right. I, th I think it gave me uh, a very different perspective, certainly a greater respect for these plant medicines. and. And it's, in some way it's succeeded, you know, it's playing out, not in the right. way that we thought. Mm -hmm. But for example, you know, if, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at the encounter with the mushrooms and the way that they came into our society, now they're everywhere. If you look at that as, a, as an alien invasion, yeah. it's yeah. utterly succeeded. Ah, not totally. a shot Absolutely. was fired, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, it was yeah. all those, all those young science nerds right. that grew mushrooms in their basement right. and uh -huh. they grew up into the, you know, and so, so in some that's ways it's, it's, to it's totally it. worked. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, no, right. such a great perspective. Well, and, yeah, it's such an intelligent species to go after the thought leaders and the people who can fundamentally understand this from a perspective that is not going to be immediately colored by the social constructs that they're in. So like, it, it seems like a similar um, story somewhat to Paul Stamets, right? He's this brilliant mind in this space and then is like ultimately affected at the very base level of his thoughts about the world and how everything works by the same fungus <laughs> you know that's fundamentally mm -hmm. like hey yeah you know, let's let's, let's yeah. talk about this over here yeah so now that experience is available to anyone i mean mushrooms are probably the most easily available psychedelic Agreed, yeah. it's great that they you know they can't be contaminated they're not you know you get a pill you don't know really what's in it yeah but mushrooms pretty much you know you know you've got the real thing and uh yeah and as paul points out and, and as i have too it's a it's great that they're good for all this therapeutic stuff, for PTSD and all the things that are good for depression and so on. What they're really, I think the real importance of them is their problems for exploring consciousness and really understanding consciousness and understanding the relationships between the world and consciousness. In some ways, all of this comes from here. You know, I talked in my talk about the reality hallucination. We are immersed in this reality hallucination. We, our, my, our brains are constructed to make a model of reality, and that's what we dwell in. Mm -hmm. You know, but the mushrooms and other psychedelics are uh, good tools for reminding us of that. Mm -hmm. You right. know, don't think what you're experiencing is the way it really is. Right. Because there's multiple versions of reality <laughs> depending on what lens you're looking through. Of course, right? you know? yeah. Usually we're looking through very narrow lenses. Right. Mm -hmm. Psychedelics temporarily widen that portal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I like to say sometimes, uh, you know, a lot of what the brain does in constructing this reality hallucination or or the movie that is our lives. You're the producer, director, and star of your own movie. But a lot of what the brain dr does is keep information out. Mm -hmm. You know, right. it sets up gating mechanisms so that what does come through can make sense. Right. If everything came through all the time, you'd just be confused. You'd be crazy. Right? <laughs> it's, right. it's much too much. Yes. So the gating <laughs> mechanisms are really important. But it's also important to be able to temporarily disable those things. Mm -hmm. That's what happens with the psychedelics. Absolutely. You can actually disable these gating mechanisms and let a lot more come in and notice right. things about your environment. It brings the background forward in mm -hmm. some ways. We are genetically, evolutionarily programmed to look at what's right in front of us, mm -hmm. you know, and not what's behind us or what's around us because for survival purposes we have to be focused on what's right in front of us absolutely you know the yeah. saber-toothed tiger that's about to eat you the bus that's <laughs> about to run into you mm -hmm. you know that requires focus in order but sometimes you want to deliberately 
let those defenses down, let those filters down and see what else can flow in. And that's right. what psychedelics can do. Absolutely. That's why it's so important to have the proper set and setting. Mm -hmm. You want to be in a place that's safe and you don't have to worry about these real world things. You right. know, right. someone looking after you or at least there, not to control your experience, to, but to be your proxy in the real world. Mm -hmm. right. you know, so if somebody, the doorbell rings or something, you know, you're not <laughs> right. the one answering right. that, you know. <laughs> you <laughs> your, trusted, uh, yeah. your trusted friend is handling all right. that. And, right. and that's really important, I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. And then, and then once you have done everything you can to optimize the, the setting, then you have the set to deal with, the set and setting. Well, set is, is you, it's your mindset. Mm -hmm. It's really everything you bring to it, everything you might have in your whole life. You might have a specific set of intentions or hopes for your experiments, but really you're bringing everything that you are to the dialogue with this plant teacher. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, any teacher that you respect, you want to put your best face forward mm -hmm. because you respect them mm -hmm. and they will respect you for that. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, uh, you know, it, it's important to optimize the set and setting as much as possible and then be prepared to let it all go mm -hmm. and right. just surrender. surrender to mm -hmm. it. Surrender to it in a circumstance where you know if you surrender, you're not going to be molested you're not going to be right. uh, you know bugged in any way you're just you have to have compassionate people who are who's got your best interests at heart mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and give you the freedom to not worry about that shit yeah right. and right. just have the experience, experience. Yeah, yeah. and then maybe help you afterwards to understand it mm -hmm. you know right but i mean that's good i'm all for integration but stop short of saying that no you're you know this is what you're supposed to think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, we can let the priest do that. We can yeah. let religion do that. But mm -hmm. this is this is different. You're you know? wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the person can, through their experience and so on, give you ideas, but they need to let you come to your own terms with it. You know. Yeah. This the is medicine this is the teacher. Absolutely, and this is actually one of the main things that I want to touch on with you because I think. You know, when you've had someone that has as much experience as you with the plants, I actually almost want to take this one step more, even esoteric, and talk about what the plants have told you about the meaning of life. And and I, I like honestly, because this is really what I come, we're talking a lot about the experience of the plants in the modern world and how we can individually experience them and those can open up portals but right. i'm actually really interested in talking to people who've had a lot of experience if you can even go here about what what are why are we doing this what is the purpose of this life what is the purpose of our soul i mean what are some of the fundamental takeaways or or spiritual maybe distillations that you've got out of these experiences. You may be disappointed in my answer. <laughs> no, but, but this is the thing is because maybe it's not as big of a deal as we make it. So I, I'm just curious to hear. People ask this question all the time. You've mm -hmm. been taking psychedelics, ayahuasca, mushrooms, whatever for forever, you know, <laughs> yeah. for, for decades. So what have you learned? You mm -hmm. know, I wish I could say I am an enlightened being and it's taught me all this, what it teaches me and what ayahuasca always re reminds me of when I take it is, remember, you don't know shit, mm. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't, or sometimes it more kindly says, just remember how little you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, that for me is the lesson, yeah. is right. the fact that nobody has it figured out. I don't have it figured out. You don't have it figured out. No guru out there has it figured out. And if they, if they tell you that they do, that immediately tells you that they don't know what they're talking <laughs> yeah. about. You know, yeah. you have to have the humility to recognize that in some ways we are very limited beings and there is, I don't think there maybe is a final answer. I think for, part of the answer or part of our mission in life is to uh, 
several things. One uh, it, it is to be grat grateful mm -hmm. for just being alive and being allowed to be a, a, a conscious being, participating in this marvelous universe. Mm -hmm without trying to over understand it or over intellectualize it or, or you know, find the final answer. The, because it may not be there. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the value of the, of the journey is in the journey, not mm -hmm. necessarily where you want to get. Mm -hmm. We all are going to get to the same place. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're all at some point going to encounter our own personal singularity. Right. We call it death. Right. We don't know what's going to happen after death certain information we have makes us think that there is something beyond and maybe there is and other information it's like just the end there's just oblivion it doesn't really matter what's important is that we're in the moment now we're living conscious curious beings mm -hmm. so part of it is enjoy that just enjoy what it is to be alive try to be compassionate and kind to other people because they're they're just as confused as you are, and they're right. going through the same stuff. They're living their lives. I think that uh, the fact that psychedelics can kind of dissociate yourself from your ego structure, I think it gives you more em empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at least I've noticed that I can look at people a lot of time, and I don't, I don't do succeed all the time, but I'm much less judgmental about mm -hmm. people than I used to be. Yeah. You know, I mean, I try to see, okay, I, I look at this person, they're obviously not happy, they've got issues there, but try to imagine where they're coming from mm -hmm. and just be a little more, oh God. Talking about yeah. sound therapy. Um, <laughs> so there is that, and, and I think it's okay, I think it's okay to, uh, uh, realize or come to the conclusion that the universe, uh, the world is far more miraculous and complex and meaningful and it probably will ever be beyond your understanding, right. mm -hmm. you know, and it's hard to accept that, especially yeah. in people that are seekers. That are they, seekers I yeah. want to know, I want to understand, right, right. I want the secret, you know, and right. <laughs> it, would, it would be nice to think that after we die, you know, we end up I don't know, in a conference room or something someplace. <laughs> Some final briefing. Okay, you've been through this whole thing. Now we're going to tell you what it's really yeah, about. You know, here's yeah. what was really going on. I don't think you're going to get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Darn yeah, it. Not, in, not in this, you yeah. know, not in the way that you would think anyway. Right. Yeah. So, so I think it's good to just relax about that and uh -huh. enjoy and that, you know, this thing about remember how little you know and right. how little you're always going to know doesn't mean you can stop learning. Right. right. You know, and that's, I think that uh, curiosity is good and, and curiosity is really what drives discovery forward. It's what drives science forward, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, I don't know any good scientist who's lost their curiosity about the world. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, uh, that's the sign of a good scientist yeah. to see a phenomenon and say, I wonder why it's like that, you know, right. and how can we investigate it more? Not that science is the only way of knowing, right. not by right. far. Not, I mean, there are many other ways of knowing besides scientific ways. Um, so that's it, you yeah. know. Yeah. What I've learned is that I don't know anything. <laughs> well, there's, there's such a huge amount of freedom that can come from that. I think if you look at it from, from the right perspective, this idea, or from a perspective, I guess, this idea that you don't have it all figured out and that you likely won't opens right. up the entire world's possibility. They're, they're, because then, if it's not finite and figured out, then shit it who knows what it might be you know who and knows what anything. it might be and yeah. there's all of these these laws and you, rules you can, and guiding you can take but, comfort in knowing that nobody really knows yeah. mm -hmm. so you know collectively as a species we're trying to create this this edifice of knowledge and of course there are gaps gaps in it and right. it's not a complete picture there is no complete picture you know because it's evolving constantly and it's changing i mean i yeah. think that as we were talking about in the panel there, I think that consciousness really is something that's fundamentally built into reality, mm -hmm. you know, and it is, uh, 
what's going on here as the universe is evolving. It's trying to wake up to itself. Mm. You know, people, I mean, I am, people say, are you an atheist? And I have to say, well, it depends on what you mean by an atheist. Right. I don't really believe that God's out there somewhere, mm -hmm. whatever out there means. I think the universe is divine. Mm -hmm. I'm a panpsychist, mm. I guess is the term, <laughs> or a, a pantheist. I think everything is a lie. I think the divine is built into reality. Uh -huh. This is what we observe, is the universe becoming more conscious, waking up to itself. And we're at least on this planet, maybe maybe we're unique. Maybe mm -hmm. there is no right. other intelligent species. I don't really want to believe that because right. I don't think we're that special. But mm -hmm. at least on this planet, we're kind of the cutting edge of consciousness right now. And, and we have these plant teachers to, to help us essentially. Right. You know, this is the mystery school in hyperspace, but you have to go into <laughs> hyperspace to yeah. have the class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, so the consciousness piece of this is the, is the, one of the things that I find just most fascinating because it seems like something that we should understand, yet I'm not even sure that we have the, the faculties to understand it. But I, on my first ayahuasca journey, one of the things that I kind of got out of that was just the simple concept that well, simple to explain concept that consciousness is an emergent property of complexity. So like exactly. once things get complex enough, consciousness emerges. And mm -hmm. it like to me, I was just like, oh, well, that just completely makes sense. But then you're left with it's like well, totally now, obvious. No. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's, like, it's just going to happen. If you get to a point that things are complex enough, then there's going to be something that fires out of that, you know? Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it's a, it's a trip. The whole thing is just absolutely mind blowing from this, from the, from the simplicity of it, and yet we can tell so many stories about it and and try to make it so much more complex to fit something that's easier to understand. If that makes sense, or, or yeah, or I don't know. You want something to be there, and you're like, nah, that's pretty simple. <laughs> we're <laughs> looking know? for cut and dried answers, and yeah. we're not comfortable without them. Right. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, I think this is part of adapting to a worldview that is closer to the way things are. Is you have to get comfortable with right. the fact that all understandings, all answers, or models, if you will, are incomplete. You mm -hmm. know, and they always are going to be. That's in a way the beauty of science, you know, because science constructs models properly, properly done. I mean, science these days is a lot of things, but, but the ideal of science, going back to the ideal of natural philosophy, is that it's a way to ask questions of nature and get answers back that are meaningful in the sense that you can verify them to right. a certain extent. And you have to be prepared to dump what you think you know if it doesn't fit what you're observing right. and fi either alter it or find a, a substitute. So thus does understanding evolve, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and science is very good at that. It's, just, right. it's a way to systematically do that. And the thing about science is you never prove anything. All, mm -hmm. It creates provisional models which might be overturned by new data at any time. So that creates, that's uncomfortable for people that like cut and dried answers. Answers, yeah. If you want yeah. cut and dried answers, religion is your thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, totally. go, yeah, I mean, so you true. must have, but the problem yeah. is the cut and dried answers are, there's no way to verify them. There's no, you just have, you're supposed to have faith. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm anti-faith. Why should I have faith? Mm. Yeah. Faith is believing a bunch of stuff that somebody tells you to believe uh -huh. in a certain way. Right, right. right. I, I think the only thing you should have faith in is yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And all this yeah. stuff. I mean, it's just a way. Uh, faith, I mean... I don't know how far d down this path we want to go. I, I love to, you know, but, but the thing is faith, uh, you know, invites you to turn off your mind, right. Right. you know, to stop thinking and simple answers for simple people. Mm -hmm. Well, there are no simple answers and really there are no simple people, mm -hmm. but you can choose to be simple 
and you're deluding yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say, okay, these are the tenets of the faith. You know, the Bible is literally true or whatever. And I'll accept that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to think about it anymore. Right. You know, it's a cut and dried set of answers, which aren't answers. Right. Well, I think you know? some people are more comfortable with the chaos of unknowing. Right? right. Some people inherently can be in that chaos of we sure. just don't know. And sure. this is where we this is what we do know in this moment. But there's a real insecurity and a real discomfort that comes for some people in not knowing things. And that is where that structure, you know, and we see it all the time as coaches and in our wellness sure. company. People want those answers. They please give me structure because I feel unsafe without structure. I don't know that I can trust myself or the world around me without this structure. And it's really but interesting to- Are you deluding yourself? <laughs> if you accept a structure that you, you, you know, at some deep part of yourself, you know it's false. Right. right. You know? Right, and, and I guess that's the question is, you know, it's almost like you have to not ask one more question. You have to stop at the surface level of things right. to accept the order of it, right? You have to mm -hmm. stop because if you ask one more question, one more why, one, yeah, one follow -up every, everything sort of falls back to <laughs> we just don't know, right? Right. And so I think it's an interesting time that we're in right now where it does seem collectively like we're getting more comfortable with the discomfort of unknowing. And I think it's interesting to think about the plant's role in this. And this is kind of going back to the panel that you just spoke on. Why do you think people are getting more comfortable with the, un with the discomfort of unknowing? And how do you feel that the plants are playing into that? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, th I think that what you say is exactly true. I think there, we, as a culture, we're getting more more comfortable with the I idea of unknowing and, and the, uh, and why that is, I'm not sure. I think I think it's, it, it, this is really an evolutionary step. This is really important. This is a this is something we have to uh, we have to deal with and confront if we're going to go to the next step. So it's nothing less than an evolutionary leap into being more mature, more conscious individuals. You know, we we have to have the courage to abandon the comfort of our delusions. You know, I, I think I mean I I. I say very much in my talk, you don't have to have faith to take a psychedelic. In fact, faith is an impediment. What you need is courage. Mm -hmm. You know, the courage to accept it on its own terms. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everyone wants their comfort zone, but at what right. price? Right. You know, I mean, and, and I think this is why religion holds out a false, a false premise, usually, right. because they encourage you to just accept this dogma, accept this worldview, even though it's, you know, probably not true. But right. well, it's comforting. Well, is mm -hmm. that a good reason to adopt it? I mean, that's yeah. It's like saying I I choose to not think about it because it's too uncomfortable mm -hmm. to right. think about. Right. Right. You know, and that's mm -hmm. that's that's not what we're here for. We're here to think about it mm. and question and be curious and so on. It's almost like the dichotomy of curiosity is met with the other side of complacency nowadays. There's seems mm -hmm. like there's these, you know, thought leaders and, and people sort of pushing the envelope of asking these questions. But then on the flip side, you almost see, you know, e you can even see it in the sedentary ways that people are in their life with their movement, with their food, right. with lack, their everything, yeah. their lack right. of seeking. And it's really interesting to see this dichotomy play out. And you can see it in America, especially, you know, you can see on one end, you know, the health and fitness movement is charged charging straight ahead and on the other end of the paradigm is the obesity epidemic, you know? So it's really interesting to think about where we are right now. It's almost like the polarity of the situation is forcing the seekers to seek harder, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to kind of, you know, kind of pull the paradigm up because there's this sense of, you know, 
even with our social media, with the way that we interact with each other, there's a laziness in a lot of ways. You know, there's a, I'm going to sit home and be on my computer instead of actually going out and being with my friends. And mm -hmm. I just think it's a, it's a really interesting time to see this sort of polarity playing out. But the one thing I want to ask you, and I keep getting back to this, this thought, because again, these are some of the overarching, you know, big esoteric themes, but I think about this idea of karma and Paul said something in the, in the panel about a shaman talking about karma. And I wonder what role or what, you know, sort of ideals you have about this idea of karma. About the idea of karma. Well, um, I mean, karma is, it's just a, another way of saying that actions have consequences. You know, so if you want to think about karma in a conscious way, you have to think about what, what do my actions, how do they impact other people, how do they impact me, how do they impact the environment, you know. And I think that uh, the idea of having good karma is another way of saying, you know, it's almost like be mindful, be mindful of place in society and nature and in relation to other people. Try to minimize the harm that you might do and maximize the benefit. And you got good yeah. karma if you can do right. that. Yeah, it's simple right. again, and right? Even, yeah, pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. yeah, simple. But for the, I think for the shaman to say that that is, that is their karma to have uh, you know that experience that diff I mean I guess it is, I guess there is some truth to that it's not really up to the shaman to save people from their karma right. they're responsible for for that but what a good shaman can do is provide a supportive situation where the person can work it out at least conceptually right. and come to come to terms with it without telling them what they need to think or what they're supposed to think but like a good psychotherapist will, will not tell you what you're supposed to think right. they'll help you to come the, the conclusion a, a way of getting you to realize what you already know right you know and we already know a lot of this stuff we yeah. just don't want to admit it you right. Know? And, right and, and we have to cross that, that threshold that's something that i think about quite a bit with psychedelics in general is that i mean we often come out of these experiences feeling like we've downloaded this tremendous amount of information and i'm more and more convinced that that information is intrinsic. It's there. It's there. We just haven't had access to it or it's been blocked off or our perception to it has been, you know, I don't know, somehow shielded by whatever our, our life experience has been thus far. And that these compounds are just giving us access into these inner recesses of what we already know. Mm -hmm. And like this fundamental truth that, uh, that just might be there, you know. Uh, the, the uh, shoot, I'm gonna forget probably not gonna be able to remember the guy's name he um, oh man he did he so he I heard him on Joe Rogan uh, like 95% of the people that, <laughs> that I get introduced to <laughs> right. and he, he I want to say he's a British um, doctor who he did a bunch of work on studying the, the transfer of information uh, by DNA so there was a there was a study that he, there's some sort of Robins in World War Two that um, when the, they knew how to open the pop tops on the milk cartons right. and drink the milk. And then when the war came, the milk stopped and it was enough generations that there weren't any Robins that remembered how to do this. And then when the war was over, the milk came back and these Robins went immediately back to opening these pop tops, right? Like in, a, in this fashion. And so he has this theory, yeah. I'm just not gonna remember his name, but he, and there were several other studies with uh, this, this sort of genetic pass down of information that there's some something that gets moved along in DNA absent of any kind of cultural, mm -hmm. you know, past it. And that idea to me seems to tie in nicely with the way that the psychedelics work in this, in this understanding of unlocking an intrinsic knowledge. What, is that something you've ever thought about? Yeah, no, I think, I think what psychedelics do, maybe a big part of what they do is they let you step out of your reference frame temporarily. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're no longer, that's, they talk about ego dissolution and all that. And that's an aspect of it. They don't invariably dissolve the ego, but they do let you look at yourself and the world in a different way, mm -hmm. uh, through a different lens almost, and understand your reference frame 
in a way that normally, because of habit and conditioning, and which can be personal and social and all that, is not accessible to it. The psychedelics temporarily disable that whole uh, uh, network. I, I don't know what you would call it. The, the mint that you create for yourself as a behaving being, it temporarily blocks that and lets you look at things from a different perspective. I think this is a lot of what the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelics is, you know. People can look at, step outside of themselves and look at their PTSD or their depression or their other things from almost, from an external perspective and get right. insights how to change the way they view that, how to change their behavior. I mean, a couple of good examples, for example, using things like Ibogaine, other psychedelics to treat addictions. Ibogaine is very effective for treating addictions if it's properly used. But what is very essential, and we were talking about it in the panel today too, the real work begins after the session is mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. So with Iboga, if you are addicted, it will temporarily interrupt the craving that if you're addicted to opiates, that's your major preoccupation. Where's the next fix coming mm -hmm, from? Mm -hmm. Ibogaine disables that for a few days to a few weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you don't use that time to best advantage, if you go back to your old neighborhood, your old friends, the old habits, it's not going to work for you. Right, You'll right. be back on the, on the wagon before mm -hmm. you know it because mm -hmm. you haven't changed your life. You haven't taken advantage of that precious opportunity. Yeah. And in the case of addiction, you have to change virtually everything. You yeah. have to reinvent <laughs> yourself, you know, at a new life. And I, I guess another interesting example of the, you know, using uh, psilocybin now in the clinic is showing a lot of pro a promise for people who are dying. Right, mm -hmm. and I think this may be where it finds its way into medicine first, is in hospice situations. So people who are dying, they have a lot of anxiety about dying. I mean, who wouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. But some of them have really a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. about dying. They're terrified of dying. And they're good candidates for the clinical trial because they can use it. And what we have found in or my colleagues, not me, but, but what they've found is very often in these, in these uh, people that have this feel that uh, psilocybin has come to, uh, to help them. Their main realization is, before the session, all I thought about was dying. Mm -hmm. You know, I was terrified of dying. I was terrified of that moment. I was, that was what my whole life was about. After psilocybin, I realized, hey, wait a minute. I am alive. <laughs> I'm alive right now mm -hmm. in this moment. Mm -hmm. Why not just be in that moment? Sure, death is out there somewhere. It's out there for all of us. But you don't need to be preoccupied with it. It'll grow right. in its right. own time. And so that's a major realization. Mm -hmm. And it's that ability to step out of that reference frame, you know, right. uh, of anxiety and basically defeat it. Um, and it, it's helped people come to terms, and you know, they're, they're you know, the, no one is claiming that psilocybin is a cure for cancer or anything mm -hmm. like that. But some of the patients that have had this find that they actually do live longer than mm -hmm. expected, right? Because right. they're not uh, tortured with anxiety. Sure. So right. Or like they might not even be tortured with death what? is coming. When it comes, yeah. I'll be ready. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. What would you say to someone out there listening who is, you know, one of those people that says, I, I keep hearing about ayahuasca, I keep hearing about mushrooms, I'm kind of interested, I'm considering this. What's the best advice for someone out there thinking of taking on this new endeavor of psychedelics? Well, I think the first thing, the first piece of advice I would have is uh, Learn as much as you can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tap the resources that are out there to learn about it. Uh, inform yourself as much as possible from you know, Arrowwood.org and other sources of information. In a lot of cities now, there are psychedelic societies that are forming, and I mm -hmm. think 
they're open to anybody. Mm -hmm. People that are curious about it should join those societies and talk to people that are more, more into it. In mm -hmm. other words, just do what you would do with any new thing. If you're going to visit a new country right. that you've never <laughs> been to, chances are you might read something about it. You'd like right. to get some background, you know, and, and so you're better prepared mm -hmm. for the experience. That there is that, you know, and then when it comes to, um, you know, finding an appropriate place or circumstance to do it, that becomes very tricky because of the prohibited nature of these things in, in the States. You know, you, people in the States who don't want to go to Peru or some other country where these things are not restricted to have a psychedelic experience, they have limited options, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, you can either try to get yourself enrolled in a clinical trial, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. so you have to have a problem that is appropriate, right. <laughs> or you can join one of the ayahuasca churches, mm -hmm. you know, which again is not that easy, but those do exist. And the two churches in, in the states, that uh, the Santo Daime and the UDV, their members are able to take ayahuasca because they they approach it as a sacrament, not a medicine, mm -hmm. and, but they're allowed under religious freedom statutes to use ayahuasca. Most of us don't have access to either one of those things. So then you just have to, uh, you know, I think at the local level, you have to try and make contact with people that are into it. Mm -hmm. Some of these local psychedelic societies that are growing up is a way to do it. And mm -hmm. you have to carefully try to find through word of mouth, really, uh, you know, talking to people that you trust to try to find an appropriate place where you could go and have these experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, my hope is in a few years that won't be necessary, that right. there will be centers that you can go to. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can go to a place that is more like a spa than a clinic, right. and, yeah, yeah. Right. you know, and have <laughs> these experiences with people who are able to look after you without controlling you and uh, mm -hmm. let it happen. I mean, I, I think uh, you know, an area of psychedelic therapy that has not been explored is really family therapy. Mm -hmm. I mean, families right. have, just by the nature of being a family, they're things get messed up and there's a lot of, you know, bad energy that goes on between oh, yeah. parents and children and man and wife and, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just part of living because we're, we're not perfect beings. We're not saints, right, you know, right. we don't behave <laughs> that way. So a lot of static builds up to, but to have an opportunity for a family to be able to go to a nice place for a weekend and have all those things, massage and mm. yoga and all the things we do to, for our, you know, health of our bodies, but then to have a really meaningful psychedelic experience mm -hmm. would be a tremendously therapeutic thing. I think you would yeah. see, you know, and we see this actually in, in you know, uh, I mean, we can look at a, a community like the UDV, for example, in Brazil, mm -hmm. where it's very much a family thing. Right. And they're, you know, I call them psychedelic Mormons sometimes, <laughs> because, you know, in a complimentary way, because yeah. Mormons, you know, I mean, they have all that religion crap. Right. right. But they also have a really strong sense of community. And, and they support yeah. each other. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. And there's, uh, and there's a lot of compassion there. Mm -hmm. And in Brazil, one of the variables that we looked at in our study was uh, domestic violence, which is the norm in Brazilian society, uh -huh. not among the UDV. Wow. Yeah. They have great relationships. Yeah, people ask Adam and I all the time. We've been married 15 years this year and together close to 20. Yeah. And yeah, people are always asking, oh, how are you so happy? How, you know, and I, I feel a little <laughs> bit, I feel a little bit bad to say, drugs. it's the drugs. <laughs> Yeah, it's the drugs. Well, it's the drugs. I mean, you know, that's the, that's the short piece of it. Yeah. It's all the, just like, I mean, just like any aspect of any one of these journeys that we're talking about, it's the integration of exactly. what you learn from it. But man, there's just nothing like it, those type of experiences to put you on the same page. Mm -hmm. You know, that's there's right. like, people yeah. say it all the time. It's like, oh, nothing will bring you together like a common enemy. 
and not that it's your enemy, but it's that sort of thing. It's something other to focus on that puts you on the same team. And mm -hmm. it's like wildly successful for us. Yeah, you know? no, it's been transformative for Why our relationship. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. They, they definitely help. Mm -hmm. you know? It yeah, really yeah. does. So. You, I want to get back to the beginning where you asked why we were so excited to see you, and we mentioned this the other night, but, you know, the ayahuasca that Adam and I uh, first partook in in our first ceremony, or all of all of our ceremonies, yeah. has was from a plant that you brought to Hawaii. Oh, yes, you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, yeah and, I, and it, I just think that's really special because... On, it's like I don't know innately I have an excitement to meet you and and I think because you know there's a connection through the plants and literally through the plants that we've experienced that has again transformed our lives our relationship the way that we are in the world is a direct direct correlate to yeah. you yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I haven't so gotten thanks my for that yet, <laughs> I, <know. but> I, <laughs> I guess oh, that'll be coming it. in the mail yeah, right? oh, man, yeah, actually, no, we've, been, we've been waiting to find you yeah, we owe you quite an affiliate check yeah, yeah. <laughs> right so thank you so much because you've had a direct impact on our lives yeah <laughs> well thank the plants it's not, thank not you, really plants. it's yes. not really me but thank you that's yeah. true in a certain sense I guess I I guess I have been kind of the Johnny Appleseed and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> First mushrooms and now ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't have an ego about sure. this because right. I totally understand. I just work for the plants. Yeah. I'm doing yeah. what they're telling me. Right. I could not do otherwise. Yeah, you know? awesome. I mean, and, and that's how I feel about it. This is not the controlling whoever's pulling the strings. It ain't me. I'm just. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just doing. Doing what seems to be the right thing. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, talking about ayahuasca and bringing people to it mm -hmm. to circumstances where they can find out for themselves you know mm -hmm. I'm very much about this is an individual thing and nobody can really have your experience for you it's your unique experience and it's your unique uh, interpretation or understanding of that experience mm -hmm. that's you know there's there's no one size fits all here mm -hmm. you know and so awesome yeah well thank you so much for joining us we appreciate your time and we really just honor and respect the work that you're doing for the plants <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah. yeah we're all benefiting from it you know i mean the whole world you know even if they're not partaking ultimately they are benefiting from this like yeah you know after your talk today you i feel like you really lined out the enormity of what's going on and that we've reached mm. this point as as homeo sapiens or ho homeo homeo sapiens not so homeo sapiens <laughs> <laughs> homo yeah. sapiens yeah, we <laughs> are we are definitely at a crossroad you know yeah. we're at a, a threshold so hopefully we will make the right choices yeah. and uh you know and it's got to happen fast i mean it seems like so much has changed there are so many bad things and they seem to always have the upper hand but then you know, I just try to look at it from an evolutionary perspective. And coevolution is not easy. Right. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll wake up enough to preserve the planet so that this process can go on. But the time frame is getting shorter and shorter because for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I don't think there's any, there's nothing to be gained from giving up, from giving into yeah. despair. Right. Mm -hmm. We have to have hope. There's lots of reasons to have hope. Mm. Yeah. You know. Awesome. Yes, we'll leave it That's at that. It. Right. <laughs> there are lots of reasons to have hope. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Dennis. We appreciate your time, and we hope to see you soon. I know you'll be in L.A. Where can folks find you, find out more about your work? Uh, well, you can always look at the Hefter research, uh, hefter.org. Hefter uh, my Facebook page is probably a good place to find out uh, where I'm doing gigs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. That's probably the best the best place. I, I no longer have an academic, formal academic affiliation. Mm -hmm. I'm not working at the University of Minnesota anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so probably my Facebook page awesome. is the yeah. best. Yeah. 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 You're not yeah. on Instagram because I tried to tag you. I don't, I'm not on Instagram. <laughs> I am on Twitter reluctantly. I mean, you know, I've tried to avoid all these things. I but, know. Yeah. Well, actually, you're on my Instagram right now with bunny ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need you to take that off. <laughs> it only lasts 24 hours. You'll be hearing from my lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. If I had a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks again. We'll talk to you 
hopefully we'll see you again soon. And folks, go check them out. Dennis McKenna, thanks for joining us. We'll see you. Bye. I hope so. Maybe in L.A., huh? <laughs> yes, absolutely. All yeah. right. Awesome. Great. Bye. Great. And that's a wrap, folks. Hope you guys got something out of that interview. We certainly enjoyed it. Yes, and, um, we did. you know, he's a cool guy. He's super cool. Yeah. And we really enjoyed that conversation. And, you know, it seems that this conversation and sort of this movement is all very synchronistic. Um, we've actually been in touch with Rhythmia. They reached out to us. And Rhythmia is a life advancement center in Costa Rica where they do plant medicine ceremonies as well as a lot of other healing modalities that folks can go and, um, you know, do a, a week long retreat and experience mm-hmm. some of the stuff that we talked about in this episode. And, um, they've invited Adam and I to come down. We're considering doing a week with them in November. And if you're interested at all in this and you might want to join us, reach out to us at info at be the Um, and just let us know, you know, this is something you really have to be called for, but if you listen to this podcast or, you know, there's just something in you that's saying, I really want to try this. It's really pulling at me and it will speak to you. You'll know if this is you, Mm -hmm. you'll know if I'm talking to you right now, you'll, you'll, it'll ping you and you'll say, yep, that's me. I'm ready. I want to do this. Um, you know, reach out to us and we can tell you about those details. We're still developing them, but if you are feeling inclined to come share this kind of experience with us, yeah. It might be your we time. We might, might be having it happen. One yeah. of the things that's super cool about Rhythmia, too, is that there's all sorts of healing modalities there, yes. right? So it's not just some plant crazy medicine. plant medicine situation, right? There's a lot of different things that, that can go on. So, yeah, there's breath work. There's, yeah. um, there's a whole, I mean, there's really a whole curriculum, essentially, and it's a week-long right. curriculum. So, you know, the best thing that you can do is go check out, I think it's Rhythmia, I don't know if it's rhythmia.com or rhythmia life advancement center.com. Right. Um, but if you put either of those terms in Google, it'll pull it up for you. You can do a little research. You can watch some of the testimonials and just familiarize yourself with it. And, um, you know, we've, this has been kind of a long time coming for us to probably do something in this arena. So if you feel so inclined and, uh, yeah, this is speaking to you, then reach out. Yeah. Hit us up info, be the wellness.com and we'll, See if it's fit. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. So we will see you guys. Speaking of Rhythmia, we will see you next week. We actually have Jerry, who is the founder of Rhythmia, mm-hmm. on the um, podcast next week. So we're really excited to share that conversation with you. And again, it just seems like this topic of conversation keeps coming up and it mm-hmm. keeps finding its way into our life. And so we're just kind of paying it forward. We're just sort of sharing with you how it comes to us. And, you know, we'll see, see how that ends up shaking out for everybody word see ya bye and not